Good morning, good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from today. It's the launch of Energy and Utilities Global Digital Energy Week, a new platform to bring together professionals from across the world in an interactive environment to discuss the key trends, opportunities and challenges facing us all in industry uh, during the pandemic and beyond. 2020 has been a challenging year for all of us, socially and for our businesses. So firstly, uh, I hope that you and your families are all safe and well, and our thoughts and best wishes are with our friends and colleagues in Lebanon at this hard time. Connected is now more important than ever, and this week will provide you with an opportunity to not only keep informed, but interact with experts from around the world for our global and regional webinars. This week, we will have 14 live webinar training sessions uh, held with experts from around the world, from the private and public sector. Each webinar will be interactive with the opportunities to put questions to the fantastic programme of speakers we have lined up for you. And it's not just a programme of webinars this week. We also have virtual networking uh, with GRIP. So GRIP was the world's first artificial intelligence networking tool, and this allows all attendees and speakers to connect virtually. So on the, the Global Digital Energy Week uh, site, the microsite, you will be able to log into GRIP there using the, the email address that you have used uh, to register for this webinar, and you will be able to connect with your colleagues uh, and suppliers from across the world. The key theme of the week will be powering the world into the new energy era, focusing on the opportunities and challenges of successfully implementing clean energy, improving efficiency, of conventional power post-COVID-19 world. Renewable energy capacity accounted for almost three quarters, 72% of new installed global energy capacity in 2019, according to the latest data from the International Renewable Energy Agency, IRENA. According to IRENA, the total installed capacity of renewable energy increased by 7.6% uh, in 2019, with 106 gigawatts of nuclear energy capacity installed. The new installed renewable energy capacity um, increased the clean share of all power capacity to 34.7%, up from 33% at the end of 2018. However, if the targets of the Paris Climate Accord achieved and the global, global average temperature increase kept um, degrees Celsius, much more needs to be done. And the challenge of successfully delivering on targets to reduce carbon and improve efficiency and increase the deployment of renewable energy has become much greater in 2020 over the outbreak. We're undergoing uh, a massive economic challenge across the world, with global economic growth likely to fall more this year than during the 2008 to 2009 financial crisis. However, while the impact of COVID-19 outbreak has created onerous short-term challenges, it's also providing an opportunity for the public and private sectors to prioritise sustainable policies and green initiatives on recovery. In fact, Irina estimates that renewable energy could spur global GDP by $98 trillion by 2050, with a global concerted effort to develop clean energy and decarbonize, decarbonize away from fossil fuels. So that's a great way uh, to introduce today's session. Renewable energy in utilities, global loop, local action. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome a stellar panel of speakers today. We have Faisal Alam, the manager of the energy sector for Neom in Saudi Arabia. We'll be taking Peter Terium's place today, who unfortunately couldn't make it, but glad to have you on board, Faisal. We have Hans Joseph Fell, president of the en Energy World Watch Group. We have Joyce Lee, policy and operations director from the Global Wind Energy Council. And we also have Nicholas Mandu, the principal renewable energy officer from the Ministry of Energy in Kenya, who um, joined us at very last minute there. So thank you, Nicholas, for that. So I think to start with, uh, I'd like to hand over to Hans, uh, who will set the scene. So Hans, would you, would you like to discuss what you think are the key trends uh, in the energy market at the moment in, in terms of moving to decarbonisation? Yes. <clears throat> thank you for your kind introduction. It is important that we discuss all these issues, global energy issues, utilities, renewable energies. Please, can you show me the first slide? Uh, 
I can't see it in the screen. Okay. There we go, Hans. You see it now? No, I do not see the slide in the screen. Okay. Do you do you share the, yes, my presentation? Yes. I've pushed it there. Can you see it in the live view box? No, I can't see it in the live view box. Oh, now no, I have it in my view box. Yes. Okay. So thank Thanks. you. And when I switch it on, it goes with you as well. I hope it will work. <laughs> so energy issues are very, very important for this world. In a holistic view, they are the key for a better world when we go to 100% renewables. Look first to all what we discussed, very serious. It is a terrible uh, time at the moment with a corona pandemic. And when we look to the necessity of healthcare, we will see immediately that the pandemic is has also connections to the energy system. Do you see my second slide? Yeah, okay. So we all, the, we have um, po corona pandemic deaths in Germany, about 10,000 in this July globally, 700,000 and more, but air pollution as well has yearly death people, died people of 7 million. This means air pollution is also a very hard issue and a threat for our um, health care. We must cancel air pollution because the air pollution makes people ill that the virus can um, capture them very fast and make them more diseases. It is the same with water pollution, with radioactivity, with pesticides and plenty others. A clean energy world is the best way to go to a healthcare world, world to a healthy world. The switch to 100% renewables is the best policy for this. And in the same time, we see that the switch to 100% renewables and others is important also for climate protection. When we look to the new NASA report from January this um, year, we can see that the global warming is already at 1.2 degrees. Our target of 1.5 degrees in Paris um, decision is very, very close to us because the increasing in this decade we must fear will be 0.2 or 0.3 degrees, and we must fear that beginning of next decade, we will exceed 1.5 degrees global warming. It is terrible for the world. The disasters, the catastrophics are already now at 1.2 degrees, and they will increase very fast. World Meteorologic Organization even forecast that within the next five years, we have a 20 percentage chance that 1.5 degrees will be exceeded. What is to do? We have to cancel all emissions, to stop all emissions. And when we see that the energy sector with the use of coal, of natural gas and mineral oil causes more than the half of all greenhouse gas emissions, it means we must completely switch on to 100% renewables to make the people healthy and to stop climate warming. We could show the Energy Watch Group together with Christian Breyer's team from La Penranta University in Finland that the whole world can be covered with 100% renewables on every place on the world, in every energy sector, in every hour of the whole year. It is possible, all the technologies are ripe, and we can switch it very fast, like we can see it in 10 years periods where big 
um, industry revolutions like computers or like plenty others, mobile phone could cover the world. It is possible because now renewables are the best economic world, um, best economic situation for the world to go to the energy sector. Nuclear, fossil gas, hard coal is much more expensive to produce energy compared with wind power and solar power. And wind and solar power in the production cost will decline in the next years, but the plenty defaults and the plenty um, terrible situation with climate warming and with healthcare, with the fossil industry, will increase their cost. Therefore, the best way on economic view is even to go to 100% renewables. What is to do? We must make all over the world a complete other policy to achieve this. First is the best way to go to clean technology in energy sector is a feed-in tariff. It is important we have not only in Germany, all over the world, the situation that the community power, millions of people will take part when we go to feed-in tariff. When we go to auctioning, it is good for utility scale, no question, but only above 40 megawatt where community power cannot take part. We need both utility scale and community power. We should create a new feed-in tariff for a combined renewable power, a balanced renewable power that is um, connected with sector coupling, connected with um, all the storage systems and everything. When anyone produces a 100% renewable system that serves the demand every hour, the whole year, he should get a feed-in tariff. Energy Watch Group made a proposal for a law for this. This is similar to the feed-in tariff law in 2000. You can share it on our homepage. We must see that the subsidizing of fossil and nuclear is supporting this polluting industry and should be cancelled completely. It would help that we can create very fast a clean world. Carbon, methane, radioactivity tax can help it. Important is research, education, and campaigning and reducing of licensing ob obstacles. When we go in every nation of the world this way, we will see that we can stop climate warming. We can perhaps even reduce the concentration of the climate gases in the atmosphere when we combine it with greening, with trees, with regreening of desert and of arid areas. It is possible for the world to do it. And therefore, my advice is we have to go it very fast. Otherwise, we will lose the world's civilization. Thank you for this introduction. And you can go to the internet site of the Energy Watch Group and can download plenty of our proposals for these issues. Thank you. Hey, thank you very much for that, Hans. Uh, that's a comprehensive overview there of the main uh, issues and challenges facing the world as we, we seek to decarbonize. And I think you, you mentioned there about the opportunity for 100% renewable energy, which people have a couple of years ago thought was impossible. But now we're starting to see that emerging as a, a possibility at some point. So it's a great time to bring in Faisal Alam from Neom in Saudi Arabia. Faisal will, will tell you a lot more about it. I'm sure most of you know that I've heard about Neom. It's a, a development in Saudi Arabia. It's a new city. It's not just a development on the, the, the coast there. And uh, it will be worth about, or the investment required will be about $500 billion. So uh, it's a massive undertaking, uh, one of the most ambitious uh, schemes in the world. And they are targeting 100% renewable energy uh, at NEOM. So I'd like to, to welcome Faisal Alam now. 
Faisal, if you, you could introduce Neom and tell us a little bit, it's a great case study about what can be done to, to facilitate the, the move towards uh, renewable energy and, and decarbonisation on a, a large scale. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, as Neom being an accelerated of, of human progress, we understand that uh, uh, sustainability is a top priority for mankind. However, scale up uh, depending on cost breakthrough is needed today. So we see the scale up is already there in, in solar PV and wind, uh, but still uh, uh, no, no scale up for green hydrogen and sustainability water and also for uh, sustainably producing uh, food in the Middle East. <clears throat> Our objective in, in NEOM actually is to build uh, the world's first 100% clean energy systems. Uh, uh, with maximum electrification. So we also have an objective of 40% of our residential areas and commercial areas uh, can be powered by uh, architecture integrated renewable generations, uh, such as uh, uh, solar rooftops, uh, facades, uh, and the public spaces. Uh, also, our objective is to have a super competitively priced power supply uh, with a low lowest cost of, of uh, energy system, uh, which can be done through efficient demand control, uh, wind and utility scale storage. Our other objective is to lead the world on green hydrogen, which is a, a new topic. And recently, you might have heard in the news that uh, NEOM is embarking upon that. So since we have uh, unrivaled solar and wind profiles in, uh, in NEOM, uh, we can unlock uh, new technologies and unlock new sectors, uh, enable uh, clean energy intensive industry activities in NEOM such as brine processing and uh, such as green hydrogen. Uh, our prime location uh, also is a, is a key advantage for us. Uh, our strategic uh, location is, uh, is, is very uh, uh, helpful for that. So uh, we can <clears throat> uh, ship to major centers, such as we can ship it to Europe and also uh, ship the green hydrogen also to Japan. Uh, and also we can benefit from substantial domestic offtake opportunities to ramp up de-risking uh, ramp up plans in Neom. So what is the vision here? We have a vision in, in Neom for energy, water and food sectors where NEOM will be the first at scale, fully integrated of 100% renewable energy, sustainably produced water and food. And in NEOM, we are working day and night to achieve this vision. Uh, uh, and we have set off of, of uh, key strategic targets and objectives that we want to achieve in NEOM which will, I'll, I'll, I'll show it to you in, in the coming slides. So, as I mentioned, we want to produce uh, the energy with a low cost, and also we want to produce water. Producing uh, low cost energy will enable industries, and producing low cost water will enable the agri agriculture activities and the food activities in, in NEO. Both combined, we can unlock and enable new industries such as brine processing and green hydrogen. Uh, as I mentioned, we have uh, key strategic objectives for energy, water, and food. And I would like to highlight the strategic objectives in front of you here. So the first strategic objective we have is to create optimized energy mix, 100% renewable energy at low cost. 
We would also like to set up a cost competitive water supply with minimal environmental impact. Uh, the third strategic objective is to produce as much food locally as makes sense. We don't want to produce uh, uh, just for the sake of production or, or for the sake of, of uh, 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 transportation. Uh, we, the fourth strategic objective is also to establish leading integrated customer experience including decentral energy. The fifth strategic objective is to build clean energy intensive industries such as green hydrogen and prime processing and also become a world leader uh, in that domain. The sixth is the most sustainable food system that oversees food security, safety, and sustainability. Last and not least, create new energy, water, and food innovation ecosystem, which will, I'll come into the, into the details of, of, of that. Uh, as unrivaled PV and wind resources is a value proposition for our uh, objective and our vision in NEOM. Uh, as you can see in the map on the right side, very, uh, or some regions has the same characteristics of, of uh, combined solar and wind characteristics. Uh, you can see in the map such as uh, somewhere in Australia, and, South, and North America, South of America. And NEOM has uh, 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 an opportunity in that also. Uh, NEOM uh, has, uh, as I mentioned, unrivaled uh, wind and solar uh, uh, profiles. So we are aiming, or we can actually, uh, generate around uh, solar combined solar and wind uh, with a capacity factor of 72 percent in neom the wind is quite steady in, in, in neom during the day and during the night and also the solar radiation we have the one of the best locations in the region for solar radiation <coughs> in neom So what are we going to do? We are going to invest in existing technologies as immediate investment. We are also going to invest in new technologies. As I mentioned, uh, we are already investing in, in green hydrogen uh, facility. Uh, uh, also, we are going to invest in future uh, technologies at an early stage, such as direct CO2 capture. Uh, to turn emission reduction into a prof profitable business in the end. And we see that green hydrogen is a key driver for decarbonization. There can be uh, uh, many applications for uh, green hydrogen, such as uh, power generation, such as heat application, and also in the form of mobility and transportation and the green hydrogen. Uh, we are going to create also in NEOM uh, an innovation ecosystem we are re where we are going to build uh, some education and R&D facilities and invest with the companies and the R&Ds uh, we are going to create an ecosystem for startups and technical companies and uh, startups which are related into AI, uh, big data management, and building a digital twin for NEOM. Uh, we are also going to invest in uh, zero liquid discharge activities uh, which are related to the water sector and also Brine processing. So we have this ambitious uh, targets and objectives, and why do we have it in, in Neom? Because 
we are building something from scratch at a scale, uh, never been done anywhere. And it's a, it's a green field in, in, in Neon. So we have the opportunity to build an advanced sustainable resources from scratch. We would like to leverage on the quality resources, innovative minds without legacy systems. So Neom uh, will have multiple cities. It's a destination and not just a one city where we are going to have an industrial city, where we're going to have residential and commercial cities and other cities in Neom. So the thinking is we want to create jobs, localize future technologies, and contribute to the national GDP in new. Thank you. Great. Many thanks for that, Faisal. That's been a, a great overview about the NEON project here, which I know, we, you know, living and working in the Middle East, there's a lot of interest, but it's, it's not just from the Middle East, it, it's globally. Uh, one of the most ambitious uh, projects in the world. And um, the falls in line with the Saudi Vision 2030. And you're right, it's, it's not just about diversifying energy in, in Saudi Arabia, it's about diversifying the economy. So they're, they're trying to ensure that, you know, developing cities such as Neon, that uh, the industries developed there uh, can manufacture clean energy components, um, and also training local Saudis in uh, new industries, um, which is an important part. So we'll come back to that later, Faisal, but thank you very much for that. And thank you. Thank you. many thanks. And this is a good time to bring in uh, Joyce Lee now from the Global Wind Energy Council. Uh, many thanks for, for joining us today, Joyce. We, we've had a, a good introduction from Hans there. Um, and, you know, Faisal talking about NEON there, um, which will have wind energy. And obviously, uh, the, the renewables, I mentioned a few figures at the, at the beginning, renewables globally is starting to really take off now. It would be great if you could give us an overview about the, the wind sector and what you feel are the key themes and, and trends at the moment. Certainly, thank you very much, Andrew. And um, it's a pleasure to be joining Global Energy Digital Week uh, this year to speak about um, exactly that, the exciting growth of wind energy around the world. And um, hopefully touch on a few other important issues like green recovery, as well as market design that can incentivize uh, the development of renewable energy along the lines that Hans spoke about earlier. So uh, first, just a quick note about Global Wind Energy Council, or GWEC, and who we are. Uh, GWEC is an industry association which represents wind power in emerging markets around the world with a focus on Latin America, Africa, and Asia. Um, our, our association and corporate members collectively represent about 99% of the installed onshore wind power globally and the majority of offshore wind power as well. Um, so here's just a snapshot of the kind of work that we do with industry and government in country on policy frameworks. And we also represent wind power at international institutions like the International Energy Agency, or IEA, as well as um, IRENA in Abu Dhabi. So I thought it might help to provide a few data points on what wind power looks like at the moment and where it's heading according to GWAC's market intelligence. And what I'd like to leave you with is a strong sense of wind's global growth and momentum, but also a sense of the urgency that we aren't moving fast enough to decarbonize. So at the end of 2019, there was just more than 650 gigawatts of onshore and offshore wind power installed worldwide. Um, as you can see from these two donut graphs with onshore on the left and offshore on the right, the majority of installations are currently concentrated in the US, Europe, and China. Um, China is a very big player in both sectors with more than one third of the onshore market and one quarter of the offshore market. Um, the latter share is set to um, increase exponentially over the next few years, while the US is a significant player in the onshore market. And over the next few years, we'll see its first large scale um, offshore wind farms start to come online too. 
in offshore, the UK, Germany, um, Denmark, and the Netherlands have really dominated the market in Europe. But we are going to see increasing installations and growth coming from the Asia Pacific region, uh, which I'll touch on in a second. So overall, we've seen very steady growth of wind onshore and offshore over the last five years, um, which had a 12% compound annual growth rate. But that said, uh, the pace of growth needs to be significantly upscaled. So I've included here a chart from Irina's latest report on global renewables outlook. And this maps out three different scenarios of decarbonization pathways, as you can see from the orange, yellow, and blue lines, um, the latter of which will keep us within that two degrees of, of warming above pre-industrial levels. You can see that for us to even have a chance of hitting that blue bottom line, um, which is in accordance with IPCC stipulations, we need significant momentum to come from the deployment of renewable energy, um, more than half of that decarbonization potential coming from renewables. Um, the rest coming from energy efficiency me measures, as well as um, fuel switching measures like uptake of um, EVs or electric vehicles, as well as green hydrogen. Um, so worth pointing out here is um, of that decarbonizing potential from renewables like wind and solar, offshore wind offers particular compound value for investment because it has um, very high capacity factors, which um, are on par with natural gas and has the most potential for carbon avoidance as a technology to displace fossil fuels um, versus other renewable technologies like onshore wind, solar, hydro, or efficient gas power. To meet this scenario, um, both IRENA and the IA are forecasting um, a, a huge scaling up of installations from the current trajectory. For wind, at least, that means scaling up to at least 100 gigawatts of new installations year on year up to 2030. And here is the GWEC forecast of uh, new installations year on year, at least for the next five years. As you can see from our current outlook, uh, we are going to miss the mark. There's new installations averaging around 71 gigawatts um, per year. And to really scale up to 100 gigawatts, we need some um, key fixes in policy and uh, a chance here to look at green stimulus measures as, as a potential catalyst. So I thought it was worth um, pointing out that that was a pre-COVID forecast and uh, the, the kind of perspective we have now in, in mid-COVID or post-COVID outlook, um, where as a society, we've been asking ourselves very serious questions about power demand and disruption to pricing and, and wholesale power markets and the, the opportunity that green stimulus provides. So on a baseline level, um, assuming that our current energy policies stay the same, um, due to COVID, we will see a downgrade in wind growth this year. Um, that's because of the disruptions to global supply chains, as well as delays to project execution and, and construction timelines. Um, we're estimating that downgrade to be about 90%, sorry, 19% of the new growth for that year, for this year. And that is mostly going to be concentrated in onshore wind. Um, I should note as well that the general consensus is that the downgrade for solar this year from COVID is estimated to be greater than for wind, given um, similar issues with supply chain and installations, um, but greater disruption to the residential solar market. Um, since COVID, we've seen commissioning deadlines extended in some key wind markets like the US, uh, India, Germany, and France. And that means that from our perspective, new installations are likely to bounce back next year um, to make 2021 a record year for, for new wind with nearly, nearly 80 gigawatts installed. And um, that means over the total five-year periods, so when we step back and look at cumulative installations, there's likely to be a, a smaller downgrade of 12 gigawatts or so, which is only 3% of the new growth. Um, and worth pointing out is that the impact for the offshore wind market will be even less due to offshore's longer project timelines and the general concentration of new offshore installations um, globally in the second half of the decade to 2030. So we're still very much seeing fast-paced growth for offshore wind, uh, reaching nearly 20% um, compound annual growth rate for the next five years. 
And while Europe, represented in the green bars here, will remain a key region for offshore wind, we're going to see steadily increasing shares coming from um, the US, as well as mainland China, represented in Fuchsia, and some new APAC markets like Taiwan, Japan, uh, Vietnam, and Korea. Um, if you are interested in offshore wind, GWEC just released a free 100-page report uh, called Global Offshore Wind Report, um, which is available on our website, GWEC.net. So I recommend anyone interested in that sector to um, go over to the website and take a look. We also touch on issues like floating offshore wind, as well as um, power to X solution. So um, it was really great to, to see Faisal's presentation on green hydrogen and um, different solutions like power to power, power to gas, power to liquid fuels, and so on. Um, but the key here on, on COVID-19 is that while the downside for wind growth might be relatively contained, uh, for our industry, for renewables, this very much represents a moment to act. So here we have an opportunity to reassess our power systems and our dependencies and our exposure to risks like volatile pricing and, and wholesale markets, but also long-term risks like climate change. Um, the global wind industry represented uh, by the entities, companies, and associations seen here have signed this milestone statement to make post-COVID recovery um, about investment in clean energy. And that means renewing national infrastructure, generating millions of new jobs, and bringing in massive capital investments to communities. So I'm sure there will be time to touch on green recovery more in discussion, at least I hope so. Um, but I did want to highlight that according to our forecasts, with the right climate resilient growth and, stimu and stimulus measures, the wind industry could deliver nearly 110 gigawatt upside to our growth scenarios by 2024, so over the next five years. Um, to do that, though, the conversation needs to go beyond um, just talking about extending project deadlines and really move towards creating the enabling environments for renewables and, and leveling the play, playing fields for renewables to compete with fossil fuels, um, de-risking financing for renewables and emerging markets to, to really let it take off. So on that last note, um, this is where I wanted to leave some room for discussion later. Uh, the general story here is um, wind has very strong growth fundamentals, cost competitiveness has, has already been addressed, resource potential all over the world, and increasing public commitment. Um, but we aren't moving fast enough, and the large-scale deployments that the IEA and IRENA and multiple global institutions and civil society groups are calling for is not going to happen spontaneously. Um, some key reforms need to be made to, to scale up and meet those levels. Um, so this image reflects some work that GWEC did for our Global Wind Report this year, which is also on our website, um, with the takeaway message being that market design needs to be reformed in a way to ensure the sustainability of renewable industries and the proactive integration of large-scale renewables into our energy systems. Um, what does that mean on the ground? Locally, of course, solutions need to be tailored, but we think the general principles are captured here, um, from grid build out to fair remuneration for developers to making sure that permitting happens expeditiously. Um, so hopefully we can talk about these things more in discussion, because uh, all of these are going to be critical to scale up renewables. Thank you. Sounds like Wait. I have to get the phone to all of my mute. <laughs> Many thanks for that, Joyce. Yeah, I appreciate you'll be busy uh, with all that wind capacity coming online. So that's uh, thank you for that, Joyce. That's a great overview there of, of the market and also the challenges facing renewables. Um, I think that the cost of renewables, as we all know, um, developing renewable energy have fallen dramatically over the past 10 years, particularly the last five years. But to get to that next stage, um, we, you know, we're renewables can, can take over from, from fossil fuels. Um, regulation and policy are key. Um, and also so the technology such as energy storage, when's that going to become cost efficient? And again, it, so policy and regulation supports that. It, it needs to be a committed effort from across the, the globe uh, to support the introduction of renewables and, and to let it flourish. So thanks, thank you for that, Joyce. Um, I did mention at the start about it being a, an interactive week. Uh, so please submit questions to the, the panellists. I'm sure as you've heard so far, they've got uh, a lot of interesting insight and an expert uh, analysis on, on the market. So you'll see on the Q&A box, I see we've got some questions already. 
please keep these coming in and we will get to those very shortly. We'll also see on the left side of your, of your screen, there's a survey box. So please submit your feedback at, at some point or at the end of the webinar to let us know what you think about the content. Uh, so I'd like to, to speak to Nicholas now, who's kindly joined us. Nicholas will also be participating later in the week for the Africa Focus. And Nicholas uh, is the Principal Renewable Energy Officer for the Ministry of Energy in Kenya. So uh, welcome, Nicholas. I think it'd be great uh, to, get, to get your overview on what's, what's happening in, in Kenya in terms of uh, renewable energy. Um, and maybe you can broaden out to, to the African market there. Um, tell us a little bit about what the, the aims are, what, what you're doing in Kenya to, to integrate renewables into the grid. Hello, Nicholas. Are you there? So I will move on to some questions now. And when Nicholas is able to, to join us, we can talk about a bit about what, what's happening in, in Kenya and the African renewables market. Uh, so as I mentioned before, please submit your questions and answers. Uh, submit your questions and we will get some answers for you. Um, so I'll start with a few questions from the audience first. Um, so we have a question here. Um, for this is for you, Faisal. It's a few questions there for you, understandably. Uh, we have a question from a renewable energy engineer in uh, Saudi Arabia, and he was asking, will they have any smart monitoring system for neon energy facilities? Thank you. Yes, we are going to have uh, smart and the latest technologies and latest systems in neom and currently we are at stage where we are uh, doing the assessment of which technologies and which system are best fit and to be deployed in, in neom at the moment okay great and we have it while we're there Faisal, we have a, another question about the energy management system used in the city um that's the question there. Um. Definitely, as, as I mentioned, so the energy management system, uh, we are uh, currently not at this stage, but we are at the stage where we are going to design a very innovative grid. And meanwhile, we are going to do the techno-economical assessments of the systems and the technologies that we are going to deploy. At a later stage, yes, we will be able to, to tell or announce which system that we are going to, to use. Okay. Thank you, Faisal. Uh, Nicholas, are you back with us now? Yes, now I'm back. Okay, great. So be before we get into some, some more questions, um, thanks again for, for joining us. Um, if you could just tell us a little bit about what Kenya is doing in terms of integrating renewable energy into its uh, energy mix. Thank you very much, and um, I'm sorry for that um, technical itch. Apparently, I still uh, get a lot of echo. Um, so in Kenya, um, currently we are generating more than 80% of daily energy actually from uh, renewable energy. 
and um, with the intros contributing roughly around 37 and uh, Giovamo's around 45 percent and of course we we have the wind which we launched last year the lake to kana wind uh, power plant giving us 310 megawatts so basically on uh, on the weekends actually we get more than 94 percent of uh, the total daily energy from renewable energies so this is just on a national this is a brief that is possible to have a uh, hundred percent of uh, all energy from renewable energy of course i know it's uh, challenging because it depends on the nature of the energy mix you have in your grid because of ramping up and so on but in our case we are very lucky because we have hydro coming in so currently we have a very ambitious uh, project in Kenya, which we are calling uh, Kenya Off-Grid Solar Access Project. And this project is basically targeting uh, those areas which are maybe far from the grid, basically 14 counties of Kenya. And is financed up to a tune of uh, 150 million US dollars by the World Bank. And we, we target to do um, over 150 mini grids. Initially, it was around 120, but um, after we have done the assessment, we have uh, seen the potential in more than 150 sites. Under the same project, we have uh, solar water pumping systems, which we are targeting to do around 400 uh, for the community facilities. And we're also going to do solar home systems and the promotion of our renewable uh, energy technologies as well as clean cooking solutions. So the approach has uh, two ways. We have a research-based financing and we have debt facilities. And of course, for the mini kits, it's going to be a design and build projects and uh, and some are going to be design, build, and uh, and operate for some years before we transfer to them to the government. So basically, to ensure there is no much suffering of those uh, who have been um, marginalized for quite some time, we are going to harmonize their tariff so that it matches with what we have in the national grid. Because, of course, you know, if we are going to charge them to sustain the, the mini-grid from the, the energy we are generating from those mini-grids, then the tariff is going to be very high for those for the community. So we, as a government, we decide that um, we are going to harmonize the tariff so that um, at least it's cheaper for them. Of course, we have a challenge of thinking on uh, how we shall go about um, integration of these mini grids to the national grid ones um, we have um, the lines in those areas so it's something also we are working on early enough so that uh, when that time comes we are we are comfortable we can plug into the grid so basically that is what we are doing in kenya at the moment thank you Okay, thank you for that, Nicholas. And that, you've sort of answered the question we had there about linking uh, the market and discussion with developing countries. So I think that's, that's a, key, a key point that we, we sort of have to recognise that uh, different countries in the world all have different uh, financial situations, uh, different levels of, of natural energy resources. Um, so there, there is a, a difference there, but you, you pointed out some of the areas that, that Kenya's, uh, some of the, the initiatives that Kenya's doing to, to integrate renewables. Uh, and you talked about um, design, build and operate uh, tariffs, um, which we have seen in, in the Middle East. We've seen a big shift, uh, particularly in the last five years, for getting the private sector in to develop infrastructure. And... Um, they, they, with COVID, the money they do have in revenues, they want to spend it on infrastructure uh, 
where there's no opportunity or less opportunity for the private sector to finance it. Utilities is a great place to start to get the private sector in. There's established frameworks. Uh, there's independent power producer models, large-scale utility projects. There's feed-in tariff programmes, which Hans touched on earlier as well. So there's all sorts of different ways that the private sector uh, can come and finance projects and help countries develop their energy sector. OK, so we, we've got uh, some more questions in here. Um, we have a question here on current hydrogen production for industries is said to be dependent on fossil fuels at our 90 percent. So how can we get can we get your ideas on how green hydrogen is a low enough cost to make it viable uh, for generation? So that, that's a, you know, a great question. We're hearing a lot of talk now about green hydrogen. As the listener has has mentioned, at the moment, hydrogen is produced uh, mainly from, from fossil fuels. We're seeing the move towards green hydrogen. Um, Faisal mentioned it in New York that they're experiencing a large green hydrogen project. There was some initial agreement signed recently uh, with the local developer Aqua Power, a big player in the in the regional and now international uh, energy sector, and Air Products to develop a five billion uh, green hydrogen facility in Eon. Uh, so Faisal, I mean, maybe you can uh, give us a, shed some light on on the project. Uh, and also how, how NEON will finance a lot of the, the energy projects. I assume that it will be by getting private developers such as Aquapower to come in and put up the capital costs, and then they will be paid for the electricity over a, an extended period. I can answer this question to green hydrogen. Do you hear me? Yes, OK, Hans, yeah, if you, if you could... Yeah. Yes. Yes, yeah. In our sim simulation for the whole world with 100% renewables plays storage systems a big role. We must balance all of the necessities what we need in energy. First is more than 90% of the coming 100% renewable energy by the whole will be electricity. Electricity will go directly to the users in electric cars, in heat pumps, and in every sector, desalination, and everywhere. But to balance it, we need batteries, we need hydro pump power stations, and plenty more, and green hydrogen is a very, very important option. But only green hydrogen, because we must be aware that hydrogen from natural gas will pollute the climate in a high, high emission density. Because the um, producing natural gas in mining areas and in the pipeline has a lot of emissions of methane. And methane is, in our view, 80 times higher intensive of, um, as carbon dioxide for climate heating. And therefore, we must avoid everything what is connected with a fossil system. And green hydrogen is possible. It can come very fast because the industry of electrolyzers are very fast running in the expanding of the industry and the costs are running down as we learned it in photovoltaics in the past 10 years and in the past 20 years. Though we have a good option, the more we use green hydrogen, the cheaper it will become because of the industry level situation. And therefore, green hydrogen is important, but we should avoid everything to use fossil hydrogen because it will pollute the world. And at the end, we have no uh, possibility to save the humankind society. Okay. Thank you, Hans. Um, are, are you with us, Faisal? Um, Andrew, perhaps I can I can also add something to to Hans's statement. If that's okay. 
the opportunity for hydrogen to be used in conjunction with wind? Yeah, um, it's it's a really important distinction. So um, I'm thankful to, to the question asker uh, because it's true. Actually, Irina estimates that um, less than one percent of current hydrogen being produced is from um, green or renewable energy sources. So 99% uh, plus are actually coming from fossil fuels and, and electricity generated by fossil fuels, which of course means um, a high carbon footprint for that hydrogen. So uh, there's a lot of excitement um, in the energy world and, and among governments um, performing their long-term energy system planning about hydrogen, but um, it's very important, as Hans noted, to make this distinction. Um, in, in terms of cost, uh, there are a few different um, for forecasts um, which, uh, which align in the sense that costs are definitely going to come down, it's just a matter of when. So IRENA estimates that um, costs for green hydrogen are going to be cheaper than um, blue hydrogen or hydrogen coming from fossil fuels combined with CCS um, in the next five to 15 years. So in, it, that's kind of a medium term outlook. Um, Bloomberg New Energy Finance sees those costs for green hydrogen um, falling to um, be on par with their fossil fuel substitutes um, before 2050. So I think um, for costs, it's it is a matter of when, and and the technologies are there. And um, I think the reason why people are so excited about this is because often when we talk about um, decarbonization and renewables, we look at the power sector. Um, but green hydrogen and um, related power to X solutions means uh, ways that we can develop technology and commercialize that technology to decarbonize those other sectors from transport to heating to industry. So um, Faisal talked about this during um, the presentation on NIAM, but um, converting hydrogen uh, that has been generated through renewable energy sources like offshore wind um, into feedstock, which could be used to create um, ammonia or methanol um, for industrial use or you can combine it with chemicals and create liquid fuels for transport. Um, you can uh, re-electrify it and um, use it for renewable electricity, um, so kind of a power-to-power -power solution. Um, there's a, a myriad ways where this could be capitalized on um, to decarbonize multiple sectors. Um, and the key is really just um, when are we going to commercialize that technology? So we've seen some really good momentum um, in recent years, governments uh, investing in pilot projects um, like NIAM and, and what's happening there, um, as well as the energy islands um, in the North and Baltic seas off Denmark, combining offshore wind and hydrogen, um, as well as a 10 megawatt hydrogen production facility in Japan. So good momentum. Um, um, and, and we do think that this is a technology that will be commercialized in the next um, few decades and, and costs are going to come down significantly. Great. Thank you, Joyce. And, and while you're here, we have a, a question for you uh, from the audience. Is low speed, micro scale, wind potential also included in your market studies? So um, as, as the Global Wind Energy Council, a lot of the work that we do is about um, utility scale winds, but um, micro scale wind uh, at, for distributed generation um, is definitely a topic of research. Uh, and there's a lot of good academics and research institutes doing research um, in this area. It's not something that our market intelligence tends to focus on, but um, we can, if, if that person gets in contact with me, we can provide a few different sources for, for the researchers that are looking at this area. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Joyce. And I think a, an area that's been touched on today already, um, talking about the next stage for clean energy uh, implementation, uh, we have storage, but also decentralized um, energy systems as well, um, which I know in the, in the Middle East re region, still heavily dominated by central utilities and national grids, like many places in, in the world. So to get to the next stage, um, there, there needs to be the opportunity for decentralized for renewables and decentralized uh, electricity systems. Um, so 
Hans, I'd like to get your, your opinion on that. How, uh, in terms of the global outlook, how can we stimulate um, renewables in decentralised power systems? Off-grid yeah, very important. Yeah, thank you for this yeah. important question. We have the experience in Germany that in um, the investment into renewable energies came mostly by nearly 90 percentage from decentralised actors. Utility scale investment was only 10 percentage of this big volume, and you should know we have now 40 percentage of the whole electricity production in Germany by renewable energies. And from this experience, we can learn that the decentralized community actors with cooperatives and private investment from farmers and plenty other actors is very, very important. The secret why the community actors could invest was a feed-in tariff. Feed-in tariff is important because it gives them a secure investment possibility that it is bankable. The bankers say, yes, there is a law that can refinance and give the security for the investment. The auctioning system is important for utility scale. Because they are big, they can make the bankability for themselves with their investment, and therefore the auctioning system is important for utility scale investment. But the auctioning system, when it is switched, to instead of feed-in tariff, what we see in plenty places in the world, for example in Germany, for example in India, in Ukraine, and in plenty other places, in every all these places, the decline of community investment was very sharp. And with the decline of community investment is the investment into renewables by the whole very Hard. So in 2013 and 40, we switched in Germany in free field photovoltaics uh, to auctioning system, and the market collapsed was per yearly investment 8 gigawatt until 1 gigawatt per year. Now, in the last two years, we could see the same in the wind sector. The wind sector was invested wind onshore in 5.5 gigawatt in uh, 2017, and now in this year we see an investment of about one gigawatt because of the fault that the community power cannot invest and the big utilities cannot uh, fill up the gap what the community power leads on. Therefore, it is very important. And what I mentioned already in my speech is we, could, we should create a feed-in tariff for a combined investment, for a 100% renewable balanced investment with storage system and everything else. This will stimulate community investment into 100% renewable power in microgrids and in plenty other situations and will stimulate as well in utility scale because it is important that the utility investment will also make a combination of the renewable energy and this is mostly solar and wind but as well bioenergy, hydropower and geothermal because these three smaller ones are important to balance partly the um, fluctuations of wind and solar. Additional will all, with all uh, storage systems, um, for example, green hydrogen, batteries, hydropump power stations, um, pressed air stations, but very important is also heat storage systems because the combination of the heat and cooling sector needs a lot of heat storage where we can get out the cooling and the heating in the northern hemisphere and the cooling in the south, southern hemisphere. So in our simulations, we have about 150 technologies simulated, and it is important to use all the technologies Then, on every place on the world. Another mix of the technologies is the most important profitable and economic situation and therefore 
it is important to go all these technologies, what is clean technology. And clean technology should be only renewable energy because nuclear power often mentioned as a clean technology is not clean. We have a lot of radioactivity emissions of um, radioactivity waste and we have an outcome for weapon materials. So nuclear power is a very dangerous option for the world. Therefore, we should not go this way. And there is no necessity. Nuclear power is much more expensive. Go to 100% renewables. That's the best economic and sustainable option. Okay. Thank you, Hans. Um, yes, and, and nuclear power, that is a, an interesting one. We could have a, another debate just about that next time. But yeah, many thanks for that. I believe Faisal is back with us. Um, are you there, Faisal? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Well, well, welcome back. Um, so, so we centralized power, uh, which you uh, um, mentioned in, in, your, in your overview. I can't hear you, Andrew, and, 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 and the, the okay. screen. Yeah. It's frozen. Okay. Just Can you hear me now, or? Yep. Okay. Great. Yeah. So we, we were just talking about decentralized uh, power, Faisal, which you you alluded to in your presentation, which which is the model Neom is is going for. Um, and if you could just tell us a little bit about how the NEON, how the, it's going to be regulated there. Uh, I believe you mentioned that it's going to have its own regulatory framework. So obviously Saudi Arabia is the biggest utilities grid in, in the Middle East at the moment, but NEON is going to be almost its, its own system. So if you just tell us a little bit about how the, the system there is going to be regulated and operated. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. So we are going to have the most uh, advanced uh, regulations and regulatory frameworks. Uh, we are in touch with the government here, uh, with the Ministry of Energy and with uh, ICRA, the regulatory body in, in, in Saudi Arabia, as well as we are having continuous dialogue and discussion uh, with the startups, with the companies, uh, with the experts to design and tailor the regulations in NEOM to be the most advanced uh, regulations in NEOM. Okay. Thank you, Fazal. And, and while we're here, we have a a question for the, the question from the same listener is uh, regarding storage, electric energy storage. Is it still too expensive um, for electrical energy storage? And is utilizing grid power a cheaper option uh, considering the wasteful effect of batteries? Uh, for the first point, yes, it's a, it's a warm region, but you'll be surprised that. Uh, uh, it is actually, uh, since the location is, is, is uh, in the north, northern area of Saudi Arabia, so the temperature is, is 10%, 10 degrees less than anywhere in, in the GCC region. 
Uh, coming to the next part uh, regarding the electrical storage or energy storage, yes, the batteries cost at, at the moment is not uh, viable at that scale, but the cost is decreasing down and we are monitoring that. And uh, we are also in touch with, with the companies who are willing to co-invest with us in, in, in that domain. Okay, great. Thank you, Faisal. And I guess I'm not an expert on the Kenyan market myself. If you could just tell us a little bit about how, uh, if there's a decentralized power market in Kenya, and if so, how is that regulated? I mean, I, I do know that Kenya does have a feed-in tariff program for renewables, but uh, for decentralized power, what what is the, the regulation in place at the moment and, and who's in charge of that? Okay. in five minutes till the end here. So I think to, to wrap up, it would be great um, if we could hear from each of you. What do you think um, is the key challenge uh, to renewables being implement, implemented on a large scale and the Paris Climate Accord targets being met? Um, is, it, is it financing? Is it regulation? Is it technology? So I think I'd like to get all of your viewpoints briefly on that. Joyce, would you like to start? Sure. Um, hopefully you can, you can still hear me. I was having some connection issues yes. earlier. Um, so I, I mean, from the wind energy perspective, uh, it's, it's really unlocking the keys to market design to enable um, installations to scale up because we know that wind is cost competitive already. Um, but that cost competitiveness, um, you know, as as prices come down and LCOE continues to, to decrease, um, cost recovery and, and compensation becomes um, a, a critical challenge for developers, not just in wind, but for other renewable technologies as well. And what we don't want is that to become a speed bump to the scale of investment that we need to see in renewables in order to um, meet these energy transition scenarios from the IEA and IRENA and the IPCC, um, because public policy is set in the opposite direction of travel. The, the commitment and the will is there. Um, so it's really just um, making those key market design reforms, which, which I touched on earlier. Great. Th thank you, Joyce. Mm -hmm. And Hans, I mean, in your presentation, you did touch on abolishing uh, fossil subsidies, something that was important. Um, what do you think is the key challenge yes. in moving forward? Yes. Important is the political regulations. On the most places on the world, we have still going on the support of fossil and nuclear power in a high, high level. For example, IEA um, mentioned in a scientific report that every carbon, that every ton of carbon um, emissions, carbon dioxide emissions, is subsidized by 100 US dollar. This is a very huge amount, and it shows that the fossil industry can compete with renewables only because it is highly subsidized. On the other side, we see that we pollute the world with it and have a lot of uh, catastrophic with uh, climate warming and with polluting with air pollution and uh, cancer and uh, diseases and plenty more. So it makes no sense to subsidize the polluting of the world. And when we cancel the subsidizing, immediately the renewable clean energy sector will 
be much more competitive when we compare it with outsubsidizing in both sectors. Renewable is still, is already the cheapest option of um, energy sector. Therefore, the political regulations are important. Cancel the subsidizing of fossil and nuclear and introduce a political framework. Best would be with fit in tariff and for utility scaled with um, auctioning sector that everyone can invest into renewables. We have the discussion often that the feed in tariff would raise the electricity price too high, and mostly they discuss the German example. This is not correct to take this example because not the renewable investment raises the electricity price, but a wrong element in our law. The surcharge increased, but the um, stock market price decreased. And we have now the cheapest stock market prices, what we ever had because of cheap renewables. We must change this law. Unfortunately, the German government and part parliament did not change it. So my message is renewables are cheap. Go to it. And when you say we have even not the financing investment in our country, back for the investment supporters like the rich nations in the north, to finance the feed-in tariff surcharge. Uh, Uganda did it already with a very um, great success. Uganda stands nearly before 100% renewables. And they have a low um, electricity price because they financed it with the so-called get fit system financed by the German bank, by KFW and other uh, bankers to do it. Other nations can do it as well. Vietnam is beginning in this uh, direction. Kenya could do the same on a political level to finance it with, with money from abroad. Great. Well, thanks for that, Hans. It's interesting you brought up the German example there, which widely discussed across the world. And it was very successful, uh, Germany, in getting renewable capacity uh, developed. But in terms of the economics of it, there has been so, some issues. So many thanks today. Uh, Faisal, um, would you like to have the, the final words? What do you think is going to be the key challenge for NEOM in terms of delivering on its energy goals? Uh, so the key challenge from my perspective is uh, is attracting uh, talents in Neom because it's a remote area, uh, innovative minds uh, and uh, experts to uh, live the moment with us and uh, in, in this greenfield and also to explore uh, uh, any other opportunities in Neom. We are already moved in Neom. Uh, the other challenge is uh, the uh, the timeline of, of uh, our projects. Uh, we uh, we have a huge land in Neom. Uh, in comparison, it is larger than uh, than Kuwait, uh, larger than uh, even uh, Belgium and Switzerland. Uh, and building multiple cities in that with the same uh, uh, infrastructure uh, could be a challenge. Yes. yes. Well, that's a challenge, but yeah, a challenge worth undertaking. Um, so many thanks, Faisal, today for, for stepping in and, and good luck with, with what you're planning with Neon. We look forward to seeing how it progresses. Um, so I think we need to wrap up there. Um, many thanks to our panellists. We, we've had a, a great uh, discussion today, some great insights. There's a few unanswered questions um, that we from from uh, you the audience here, so we will put those to the the panelists and we'll endeavour to get you answers back for those shortly. There's been a few questions about presentations. Yes, the presentations will be available. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for listening, and uh, I hope you're you're enjoying the the digital week so far. Plenty more to come uh, at two o'clock this afternoon. Uh, in Gulf Standard Time, so that's in 40 minutes. I will be moderating another webinar, 
uh, looking at the GCC, so the key drivers and trends in the GCC energy sector post-pandemic. Uh, the renewable sector will play a key part in that. So thank you uh, very much to our panellists for, for setting the scene for the week. Uh, please fill in the survey on the left part of the screen. Hope you found it enjoyable today and useful. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Many thanks. Bye for now.